massive battle rages on the distant world of Agilis, a planet of billions being liquidated of souls by five different factions from every corner of the galaxy. Me, playing as the blue ultramarines, has been chiseled down to a few remaining territories on the board. All is feared lost. Until, out of the darkness, the unexpected. A move that makes everything you know about attacking and risk absolute nonsense. So hated that it's a curse on the sanctity of board gaming. The One Man Army. Tell me, what happens when the world's largest precision painting challenge, Warhammer 40k, and your childhood Napoleon wartime simulator, Risk, knocks boots? They birth this. Risk Warhammer 40k. A game with several brilliant advancements on the classic, but also sports the perfect recipe of rules, rewards, and combat to absolutely annihilate your understanding of a good time. You feel captivated for quite a while after popping this lid, getting myself lost in the detailed minis, intricate artwork on the cards, and and the enchanting game board. Players, game creators, board game hackers. In this video, you'll find out precisely what the ultimate risk attack move really is. If a single troop can actually take on an entire army, and how all of it's a massive hated curse. But first, there's board game testers, and then there's me. Pones Jones, a master board game hacker. My team and I play, hack, and unlock a game's true potential. Hold up! Authenticity check here. There's many Risk games that have a similar structure to this one, so tell me which other version you've discovered that has their cursed one-man army. Oh, and I used some AI picks to get you in the mood while describing the lore of this game, but this script, it's all me. 40,000 years in the war-torn future, our colonized grimdark galaxy is under constant siege by numerous alien races and the demonic forces lurking deep within the warp. It's a horrific nightmare-fueled dimension visible by the countless billions on this wasteland of a planet halfway across the galaxy called Vigilis. And this is where the game's setup begins. Five factions making planet fall, claiming lands one by one in turn order, just like in classic Risk. Now, let's jump ahead to step four of this game's setup. A direct level up from the classic Risk. Draw four major and four minor objective cards, laying them next to the board. Completing an objective gets you a reward card. Oh, and you win the game by collecting three of these objective cards, meaning ganging up on the leading player is now a legit winning strat. But if you've been hacking board games for as long as I have, you'll have already spotted the next drama-inducing plot twist. Visible objective cards before you place troops. Meaning I can study the objective cards in play and position my blue ultramarines to complete an objective before the game even begins. Or I could sabotage another player doing the same thing. It's brilliant. See, every faction in Risk is constructed the exact same way. Single troops and vehicles representing three troops. Troops can attack and defend by rolling dice. And just like in classic Risk, combat plays out with up to five troops total. Up to three from the attacker and two from the defender. One die each. Rolls are compared highest to lowest with ties going to the defender. And the leftover dice are simply ignored. All losing comparisons cost that player one troop. But what makes this game's combat stand out from classic Risk? Faction leader. So what is a leader and how do they contribute to gameplay? Each punched cardboard leader has a special ability that is applied to the troops of the territory the leader resides in. But if the last troop in that territory dies, then the leader dies with it. Then is resurrected on your next turn. Like that one spider you swore you killed three times now. Hold up cards and tokens. W.T. Frickin' Crap Games Workshop, the makers of Warhammer 40k, a company that's more profitable than Google, with estimates of over 10,000 unique character designs since the company's inception. You couldn't spring for five liter minis to round off the feeling of this game? No. We get punched cardboard. The best I can describe the feeling is a massive, unexpected terminal velocity drop off a cliff, to the point where my face does one of these every time I see what could have been. So what are these special abilities then? Okay, but, <laughs> okay, for real here. I first wrote the script going off in a temper tantrum explaining how utterly overpowered down to completely laughable these abilities really are. But this video would have gone on forever. So instead, I simply listed them in order from insane to pathetic. First, war boss, orcs. Add plus one to all attack dice. Second, Marnius Calgar, ultramarines. Add plus one to the highest attack and defense dice. Third, Magus, gene stealers. Add plus one to all defending dice. Fourth, 
Chaos, Abaddon the Despoiler, Chaos Space Marines, Reroll All Ones, and finally, Autark Eldari. The final army in this leader's territory must be defeated twice before it and the leader are removed. <laughs> <laughs> this ability is utter garbage. And I'm gonna have to leave it there or I'm gonna be going off on some big old tangent. One by one, the sludge pool of orc blood begins to paint the ground black. Over and over they fall, rushing forward to take the other's place. What's causing all of this certain death? A single ultramarine. Why? Well, I've found a hole in the combat system. A hole that not only causes players to question their sanity, but that also gives me double the abilities. Here, let me explain. At the start of the game, things were looking bleak until I found an opportunity, a weakness in the enemy's lines, and I went for it. I I'd up the conquer six territories in a single turn objective card. I briefly celebrated and snagged my invaluable reward card. Like we saw earlier, a normal battle with two big armies has up to three attackers and two defenders stepping forward to fight. One die rolled for each. The key phrase here, up to, meaning I can choose to only attack with one troop at a time. Ah, that sounds ridiculous and utterly painful. Why would you do that? Well, for four reasons. Firstly, putting only one man forward you from bleeding troops. Ever had a massive army squaring off in battle with your dice rolling highs and lows? Hearing each of us loses one troop over and over again, and before you know it, your army is gone. Secondly, my leader's ability only applies to a single die in battle. So if I only pull one troop forward, then I only roll one die, meaning every roll gets the plus one buff. Thirdly, my major objective reward card. Ah. <sighs> the key to pulling off this entire OP strat, a card that unlocks the sacred second chance. Reroll your lowest attack die once per attack roll. Well, if I'm only using one die, then I get a complete second chance to roll the highest number I possibly can. And fourthly, the reason I call it a curse on the sanctity of board game risk is usually an ungodly long, like claw your eyeballs out long experience. The game's one saving grace is that you can get through combat quicker by rolling the full five dice. So what happens if I'm only ever pulling one true, rolling only one die exclusively in giant never -ending Ending risk battles. The game gets longer and longer while the rage begins to brew as players begin to realize they will soon die of old age at the kitchen table, compelling them to try vigorously to remove their own face. <laughs> So my one troop gets two chances to roll the highest number possible with a plus one to top it off, all while keeping my troop losses under control and basically guaranteeing the most impatient player rage quits in a fit of glory. Winning! Okay, stop! As much as I'm a hacker, I would never do this to my group on game night, but it is a very real, completely legal tactic. But there's a whole other side to this unholy one-man army, and that's when my ultramarines and their leader are defending. See, I get two chances to roll a hollowed six, totaling seven after the buff. And since defenders always win a tie, the seven becomes straight up unbeatable, like a god mode unlock. And yes, you can kinda half-ish do this with orcs or gene stealers, but you're stuck with attacking or defending. You don't get both, like with the ultramarines. And there you have it, the cursed one-man ultramarine army from hell. But we're not quite done. See, there's something deceitful going Going on here. Something so ungodly sinister it makes everything we just talked about seem absolutely benign. Because in this next video, I show you every single mistake, blunder, and utter failure risk baked into this game. Failures that are so numerous they feel almost intentional. The only question left is how high can you count?